check one two check check one two check one two check one two check one two one two check 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 one two real low on uh in line level Let's see if i can crank it up here check one two three four check one two three four check Okay, 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 okay. Mic check, check, check.
up, I've been to the galas in the Army Navy.
Good afternoon, everybody. At this point, we would like you to start taking your seats as our event will begin shortly. Again, we would like everybody to take their seats as our event will begin shortly. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the Aspen Institute. My name is Nick Burns. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Strategy Group and the Aspen Security Forum. It's a great pleasure to see this crowd. You're all going to be on C-SPAN, so be on your best behavior. Um, and we're here to launch a very important book on the future of the U.S.-China relationship called The Struggle for Power. U.S.-China relations in the 21st century. I want to say a word about that and then the program, but first I want to recognize some very distinguished guests. I want to recognize the co-chair of our organization, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who's here with us. And you'll be hearing from Secretary Rice uh, in about a half an hour. She'll be one of our conversationalists. Our other co-chair, uh, Harvard Emeritus Professor Joe and I, our great friend, could not be here with us, but he's very much part of this effort. I want to pay tribute to our former Secretary of Defense and a very good friend of mine, Secretary Bill Cohen and Mrs. Janet Cohen. Welcome, Secretary. <laughs> Janet, welcome. 
And I also want to pay tribute to one of the, I think one of the people who, for me, embodies bipartisanship, who's involved in every effort to bring people together across partisan lines, and that's Steve Hadley, our former National Security Advisor, who's here today as well. Our director is Anya Manuel, my close friend. We work together. You'll be seeing Anya on stage as one of the people uh, during the interviews. Our subject is China. Um, I think all of us agree that our relationship with China is going to be the greatest challenge that we face as a country in the next several decades. And it's an important moment in that relationship. We established full diplomatic relations in March 1979, Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping. For most of that time, in both Republican and Democratic administrations, we all felt in both sets of administrations that we were seeking cooperation with China. That was the basic strategy, and the Chinese felt the same way. In recent years, there's no question that both countries have swung from cooperation to a strategy of competition. And that competition gets to the heart of our vital national interests overseas. We're competing for strategic military predominance in the Indo-Pacific, where the United States has been the dominant power with our allies, Japan, South Korea, and Australia, for 75 years. But the Chinese are making a concerted effort to cut into that American and alliance military power. We're competing to see who will dominate the next generation of military technology. And two years ago, the Aspen Strategy Group spent three days thinking about that subject. AI is going to be militarized. Quantum computing is going to be militarized. Biotechnology is going to be militarized. Which country will get there first in the new generation of military technology that's going to define power in the world in the next several decades? We're also certainly competing as the number one and two economic powers in the world. You've seen President Trump uh, with his trade negotiations with the Chinese in the first phase deal that was announced just last week, but certainly competing for economic primacy. And I think from the perspective of the United States, and I very much support what President Trump has tried to do to get at the heart of Chinese difficulties, will the Chinese agree to live on a level playing field in terms of trade with the United States, with Japan, with Europe, uh, and the European Union? Finally, if you think about these battles that I've just talked about, strategic predominance in the Indo-Pacific, military technology, trade. There's a fourth battle, and I'll certainly want to talk to Secretary Rice about this, the battle of ideas. Xi Jinping is brimming with self-confidence about the authoritarian model of how that country is organized. He thinks it should be exported, and he thinks other countries should adopt it, and Vladimir Putin thinks the same way, and Mohammed bin Salman and President Erdogan think the same way. Americans disagree. Europeans disagree. Japanese disagree. It's, it's, not a, it's not a cataclysmic battle of armies. It's a battle of systems and ideals about how we think society should be organized. The one cautionary note, that we spent three days, Republicans and Democrats and independents together debating this issue. We produced this volume that all of you, I hope, have a copy of. If you don't, there are copies available uh, just in the back, which be, is being launched today. We produce it on a nonpartisan basis. The ethos of our organization is we're Americans. We believe in our country first. We do not believe that, that partisanship should interfere with our analysis of big strategic challenges like this. The big cautionary note would be this. Are we overestimating China's strengths and underestimating China's weaknesses? Are we even underestimating the ability of the United States and its allies in Europe and in Asia to cope with this threat peacefully and successfully? We have someone here in Condi Rice who spent the better part of her academic career, thinking, her early career, thinking about an empire that crashed, the Soviet Union. And there were times when we were working together, Steve, uh, myself, Secretary Cohen, in the, maybe the 70s and 80s, when we overestimated the strengths of the Soviet Union. Do we have the self-confidence to think that the United States and its allies have a way forward for success in the 21st century? I commend this volume to, to you. We have Republicans, Democrats, and Independents writing on it. And today we're going to hear from four people. Uh, my colleague Anya Manuel is going to interview Mike Pillsbury, uh, 
Mike is an advisor uh, to President Trump. He's a China specialist. He's really smart. And he's at the Hudson Institute, and it was a pleasure to spend three days with Mike uh, earlier this year. The second interview, I'll interview my close friend and former boss, uh, Condoleezza Rice, about these issues. The third interview, I'm going to interview uh, Kathleen Hicks, who is one of, I think, the smartest young strategists we have in the United States on, a, on the positioning of the American military and our ability to respond to these threats. She's at CSIS, where Secretary Cohen is on the board. And uh, fourth, Anya Manuel is going to interview uh, a guy who's a force of nature, Kurt Campbell, Ambassador Kurt Campbell, who for President Obama was our Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, architect of the strategic pivot that the United States must make to the Indo-Pacific, a compelling thinker on these issues. And so we have four conversations. We hope it'll be useful to you. We thank you for being here. And without further ado, Anya Manuel and Mike Pillsbury. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I have to say, as a when we were in Aspen last August, I thought we had one of the best discussions we've ever had at the strategy group, both in terms of depth of substance, diversity of opinion, but being respectful of each other's differences of opinion. And you'll see we have a slightly different format today than we would normally do with a bunch of big panels where everybody talks. We wanted to give each we wanted to highlight a couple of our authors for the books and give each of them really an opportunity to dig deep into what they are trying to say. And Mike Pillsbury, of course, needs no introduction. Yes, I do. <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> a fellow at the Hudson Institute, former senior government official in the Reagan administration and elsewhere, currently I would say, you're always modest, but I would say you're the number one outside advisor to the administration on China. Um, back channeling, if I can say so, you took six trips in preparing for this trade deal. It so, like an impeachment discussion. It does not. <laughs> it does not. Everything I did was constitutional and legal. It was. It was. We will stipulate to that. <laughs> but so I wanted to really start broad and then narrow in today. If you could, I'm not asking you to speak for the administration, but you know a lot about what they think. Um, what is the Trump administration's objective? What's the goal with respect to China? Is it to level the playing field and try to get along and muddle through? Is it pushing back like we did on the Soviet Union? Is the goal that you ultimately get a different system there? What are we driving for? Uh, I think the first point to make about the Trump administration Oh, sorry. So I can edit my remarks. <laughs> I think the first point to make about the Trump administration is the multiple voices within it who, from the point of view of the standards established by previous administrations, shamelessly leak their debates. Often on the front pages of the Wall Street Journal, you will read something like, yesterday in the Oval Office, you know, someone said, someone said this, someone said that. Um, so this is an administration that it's very difficult for outsiders to understand who speaks for the administration. So in my view, uh, it's the president alone. And one thing we're learning from the Ukraine uh, impeachment discussion, seems to me, is the permanent bureaucracy, up to and including the cabinet uh, secretaries, are not necessarily involved in what the president's concerned with. So my observation, I was not a, a Trump campaign supporter. My candidate lost. But I was still invited to the transition team. And what I observed from the very beginning is the president-elect uh, at the time was deeply, personally interested in China. This surprised me. I, I thought during the campaign when he would frequently say phrases like, China is raping our country. I thought, this is just campaign rhetoric. It clearly works uh, in some counties. Um, and that's, that's, that's the end of it. But in fact, uh, the president has acted, as I say in my chapter in the, in the book we're here to discuss today, president began to act as the China desk officer himself. 
And, and as a China hand, people like David Chambao here in the, in the room and Lonnie Henley and others, we should all be thrilled that the president himself is taking China very seriously. Many presidents really haven't. But the hazard to that is that everybody around him then wants to influence his view and find out what his view actually is. And over three years, what I've come to understand about President's approach, President Trump's approach to China, he thinks of himself as a deal maker. He's a businessman, a billionaire, and he wants to make a deal with, in some sense, another company, which happens to be run by another CEO, Xi Jinping. So his focus from the beginning, uh, during the transition, was on Xi Jinping. And one of the early developments was he had, in my view, unfortunately made a phone call, taken a phone call from Taiwan's president, or as the Chinese say, so-called president. Um, and the Chinese began to punish the Trump administration for that phone call and would not actually have a, um, a summit anywhere until the president clarified his views. But the way he did that set the tone for the next three years. He said, at the request of President Xi in the phone call, uh, I am going to abide by our one China policy. That opened the, that, that removed the obstacle for the Mar-a-Lago summit. So but Mike, I'm not quite you, sure since where you, know, since you, you know want to go president's on, mind your... <laughs> on this. You, since you know the president's mind on this as well as anyone, and it's possible that there are multiple goals here, but is it, watching as a total outside observer, I live in California, I sometimes hear from the administration's pronouncements, we're looking for China to really fail. And sometimes I hear, no, we're just trying to create a, play, a fair playing field here so our companies can compete and that we can have our own spheres of influence and we can find a way to all get along. Which end do you think he falls on? Well, I've been advocating that the president should give a speech on China himself and answer uh, these kind of questions you're raising. Uh, the vice president. The, the vice president has given two speeches tough. in great detail, um, but they too have created questions about what ex exactly is he saying. He specifically said we don't want to decouple, but soon thereafter. Uh, people associated with the administration, Steve Bannon in particular, and this Committee on the Present Danger from China, uh, which I'm not a member of, they began talking about, no, decoupling is, ex is exactly our goal. And in fact, it is happening. <laughs> you know, we're inadvertently, living in California. Inadvertently. Yeah. So if the president were to give a speech on China himself, I think you and others in this room would probably be well advised to suggest what should be cleared up. Uh, I think there's considerable ambiguity. Now, my own view of all this, President, for some reason I don't understand, invites me into the Oval Office to witness some of these debates. Mm -hmm. And there they all are. Do you participate or you just witness? Uh, he uses me kind of as a foil. And it doesn't take long before you realize who in the room likes me to be there and who doesn't. <laughs> So that debate continues, and I think the president- I won't ask you the obvious follow-up. <laughs> I think the president did this as a businessman. When I joined the transition team, I quickly placed my order with Amazon.com for all 14 books the president has co-authored. And several of them have China sections where he lays out some of his thinking. Next time you, you know, a new president comes in and you're working for him or her, I recommend read all those books. That's right before you go to the first meeting. That's right, and they're pretty tough. I've read some of those sections and they're quite tough. So. He has a point about good China, bad China, which he hasn't said publicly yet, but it's in the book. And he lays out a good China that he would like to see, uh, and then he demonizes a bad China. And he implies something that Steve Schwartzman has also said uh, several times on television, that this really, the whole course of US-China relations to a large degree is up to China and the debate they're having. They have their Steve Bannon, and they have their Peter Navarro, they have their Steve Mnuchin. Um, and that debate is part of what I'm supposed to be following, uh, because I've known some of these scholars and former officials for 30 years. Let me actually go there with you next, the China side, because you've obviously written 
the book, The 100-Year Marathon, that's now required reading in all of Washington. It's an excellent book. When you go to China now, I see, when I travel to China fairly frequently, I see the hardliners winning. Um, and it's harder and harder for the reformers who want domestic reform for their own purposes, much less anyone who wants political reform, to really get the ear of their president. And the worry is that the hardliners on both sides are winning, and that's, that's driving us apart. Is that what you see? Uh, yes, and it's also what Henry Kissinger warned about at the very, in the very last chapter of his book on China, that his nightmare, and he forecast what he called an unfathomable war on the scale of World War I between the US and China if the hawks on both sides got into power. And he mentioned, I got the title 100-Year Marathon, in fact, from one of the Chinese hawks I know pretty well. And uh, Dr. Kissinger spends a whole page on that particular hardliner. Um, his name is Liu Mingfu. We had him on his first visit to America. We had a cocktail party for him. <clears throat> and I took him over to the Pentagon. But Dr. Kissinger said, this will never happen. This is a fringe element who reflects uh, some stream of thinking, but this will never happen. Uh, but it did. So I think the hardliners, which is a very vague term. And the, by the way, the China field and the CIA have known a great deal about the hardliners all along. But the general estimate has been they were not very powerful. And in many ways, <clears throat> all of us fell victim to the foreign ministry in Beijing telling us, oh, these hardliners have no power. Nobody listens to them. And Liu He and Wang Shishan, <laughs> sort of the ones you roll out for Western events. Well, yes. you raised Kissinger at a Bloomberg forum that just happened in November. Kissinger famously said, we are in the foothills of a Cold War with China. That doesn't mean we need to go all the way. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the administration going? Do you see them pushing towards a Cold War? Or do you see them wanting to pull back from that? Again, many voices. Uh, are inside the administration. I don't think the president wants a Cold War with China at all. Uh, I think he's quite aware of China's military uh, improvements. But you'll notice, look at little micro indicators like the South China Sea, to what degree do our freedom of navigation patrols um, observe innocent passage rules, or they don't turn on their weapons radar, they don't go in circles, they don't go at night. There's five criteria in the Law of the Sea Treaty for how you can make innocent passage without challenging the country's actual territorial claims. Seems to me, as I understand it from Navy spokesmen, we have not uh, aggressively challenged the Chinese with these, with these kind of maneuvers. We've come close, and there's a wonderful Harvard study about this. I don't know if you've uh, seen it. Several people referenced the study on exactly how we approach the issue of freedom of navigation missions. But that could change if the whole trade deal goes sour. And the trade deal is very voluntary on both sides. Um, I could envisage a Cold War breaking out inad inadvertently, for lack of a better word. And when you look back at the details of how did the first Cold War start, it's not as though the two sides in 1946 say, OK, let's have a Cold War. It's a series of blunders. Well, at some point, you had the X article and we did formally launch it. And you think we're not quite there yet with China. We haven't formally launched I, I agree launched. with Kissinger's phrase about the foothills of a Cold War. I think it can be avoided, uh, but it takes two sides. And the intricacies of this trade agreement uh, could, could have laid the foundation for a Cold War. That's right. I do want to get to the trade agreement since you were so instrumental in helping get it through. It's a real accomplishment. Let me get there slightly circuitously, though, because you mentioned freedom of navigation, the South China Sea. And in, in the US, at least in the news cycles, we've been so fixated on the trade side of this that, that I just want to get your views a little bit on the other parts of our relationship. What's happening diplomatically and on the security sphere? You spend a lot of time in your paper, mm -hmm. which was excellent. I have it all marked up here, <laughs> talking about our allies mm -hmm. in Asia and what each of them are doing, and especially on the military side. Um, I thought this paper was excellent. It made some really good points about what we are already doing, what we should be doing more with our allies. When you see the administration's defense policy, you see some of that, but also, in my view, inconsistently, 
you see them asking Japan to more than triple its payment for our bases. And South Korea, same thing, triple their contribution. How do you view that? And is it part of a cohesive strategy, or is this multiple people not working together? Well, this is, a, this is an area where the president had strong views reflected in his books and speeches uh, 20 years earlier. So the notion that we're being ripped off by our allies is a very core uh, Donald Trump view. Yes. If you want to ingratiate yourself with him, if you and I are going in to see him in the Oval Office. Well, you're there all the time. I'm never there. If we're both <laughs> going in to see him, and I say, sir, you know, we need to work with our allies, and we share values, and then you say, sir, they're ripping us off again. We need to ask those South Koreans to go 500% more in host sharing funding. Who is the president going to listen to? He'll that listen to you. <laughs> and I'm afraid this kind of calculation goes on around not Secretary Cohen, but other cabinet secretaries would try to get the president to go along with them and not get ousted. So we've had a lot of firings. You know, 100 people who are close advisors to President Trump have been fired now in the first three years. Uh, including cabinet secretaries. And there's a pattern to the firings. If you say or do things that are kind of yesterday and that the base doesn't agree with or the president ha doesn't agree with, it's a good way to get fired. Mm -hmm. And if you tell the press about your valiant effort you know, to work with our allies, that's a good way to get fired too. Yeah, that's a very good point. I myself feel that the crucial part of our China strategy is to bring our allies along to listen, to get their ideas, um, it's absolutely crucial. So in my chapter uh, for the book, uh, I try to describe what the administration is doing uh, with each country in Asia. But others oppose my point of view, and they think I'm a kind of a deep state infiltrator uh, to think this way about the importance of allies, and not just treaty allies, but our partners and friends, like especially India. I think India in many ways is the key to our overall approach to China. Thank you. You don't strike and me as very deep state. <laughs> and oh. Your book, by the way, discusses equally China, India, and America. So if you're going to praise me, I need to praise you as well. Everybody should buy your book. Does everybody have a copy of Anya's book? <laughs> it's called This Brave New World. This is how you get the moderator to be really nice to you. It's only softball questions from here on out. <laughs> Who does not have a copy of This Brave New World on this book? Put your hand up. <laughs> Secretary Cohen, OK. Perfect. Well, I will now India. follow with a softball. <laughs> Tell us about the, fa the phase one trade deal, and what do you think are the most effective parts? Well, the president had a signing ceremony in the White House last Wednesday and had, had a lot of CEOs from very large uh, corporations present and then singled out each one with a kind of intimate uh, joke, uh, including Hank Greenberg, by the way, one of uh, China's uh, friends and highly knowledgeable. So Dr. Kissinger was there. He was got praised. Um, you the, were there, you were uh, praised. <laughs> well, he got me in trouble with my fellow China experts yet again because he referred to our partnership. And I had, would not dream of having a partnership with the president of the United States. But the point of the signing ceremony was the Chinese were there. They laughed. They applauded. Um, you can see there's not any acrimony. There's no bitterness. We've had a really tough two years to get this phase one trade agreement, which nobody can understand <laughs> because it's written for trade lawyers. Uh, the Chinese translation, which I've been through, is also quite ambiguous. So it's a celebration that's so far so good. Mm -hmm. There's goodwill. There is a recovery from this reneging that the president reacted very quickly to. Um, and the number of Chinese who've come, in some cases the delegation was 30 Chinese officials. We, up, we had them all up on the fifth floor in the Indian uh, Treaty Room. Uh, they're the people who run China run the economy and trade policy of China. Uh, at one point, uh, Liu He had a title, Special Envoy of Xi Jinping. And then the Chinese told us uh, in September not to use that title anymore. So then we had to ponder what that meant. 
but Leo He himself showed up. So I see this as really good news. The details are not so important to me as the um, cooperative attitude after a really severe emotional experience for both sides over the last two years. Right. So I've read the agreement only in English, not the Chinese version. What I thought was extremely novel is the dispute resolution mechanism, yes. which I know you're calling something else now because yes. it's sensitive on the Chinese side, but we're here in English. Um, really novel, you know, to have one-sided tariffs if you need to, and it, we'll, let's hope it works. And on the intellectual property side, some pretty important gets, especially on the biologics and pharma and all of those things. Was it worth the cost, the amount that the economy has suffered because of the tariffs, was what ultimately came out of the phase one deal worth it? I think so, but I try to put myself in the mind of another president or other future presidents who are gonna inherit this problem uh, and whether they would be willing to use tariffs uh, as much as President Trump did uh, against the wishes of some in his administration, and to threaten other measures. There was a campaign in the press, uh, sometimes using a memo I supposedly wrote. There's a campaign in our press that said, if the Chinese don't come around, we're gonna put capital constraints on them. Uh, the, uh, the waiver President Obama gave in 2013 on uh, Chinese accounting anomalies not being required to be reported to the SEC, that will go away. Uh, the Chinese have talked about needing $3 trillion in uh, capital over the next few years. Um, the US government ha would have ways to, to slow that down and hurt the Chinese quest for a really a large amount of capital, even by New York real estate standards. So those threats, I think, may have worked. They were not made by the president directly, but it just it, if you look in Jim Steinberg's opening chapter in here, he talks about the different voices on China policy, blue team and so forth. The Chinese follow that very closely. They know a lot of the American players, but maybe all the American players. So they had to make an assessment uh, last September, October. We could be really badly hurt right. by these additional measures at this escalation beyond just the current tariffs. And I think that may have uh, affected their decision, but they did it with goodwill and a kind of Chinese philosophical fatalism, that this is a long game, you know, this is gonna go on for hundreds of years. So yes, China has to make a concession. And then they brilliantly marketed it by saying, at the White House signing ceremony, there's a, there's a letter from Xi Jinping that Liu He read out. There's his own remarks, and then there's Ambassador Tsui's remarks. All three said this agreement is important for global peace and global economic growth. In other words, we Chinese are taking one for the team, the rest of the world, from these unreasonable pressures and tariffs and threats and so forth. I thought that was brilliant media handling by the Chinese side, and I told them so. Right. We're not sure if the rest of the world agrees with them, but <laughs> depends on how we do with our trade talks with Europe. Um, final question for you. Everyone's talking about a phase two the strategic and economic dialogue has been renamed, yeah. but apparently it's going to happen again. Yes. Any chances that you will see anything close to a phase two before November? Well, as the president likes to say, we'll have to wait and see. There <laughs> How are some long issues. Will we have to wait. <laughs> uh, there are some issues that uh, the president could solve when he goes to Beijing to see his friend Xi Jinping. I think it's escalated, by the way, beyond friend. Now they love each other, according to the president's comment at Davos. For a while. <laughs> so one theme is the subsidies. And we're in the dark, because the subsidies, to some degree, are secret in China. There's not a big list they publish saying, no, here's, uh, they've got roughly 80 state-owned enterprises uh, corporations on the Fortune uh, 500 list now. They, by the way, they beat American companies. There's now 129. Chinese companies on the Fortune 500 list, 80 of which are state-owned. So subsidies are secret. We will need their cooperation in their identifying what subsidies ought to be eliminated, which they promised at the WTO negotiating round to eliminate. So that's one issue. The second issue is we'll begin 
the enforcement phase or the bilateral dispute recognition phase more properly as phase two is going on. So we're going to have the, the states, the summit, the issue of secrecy of subsidies, the enforcement uh, that could turn into a very nasty quarrel. And then the other policies in diplomacy, military sphere, uh, there's quite a long list actually, our cooperation with China, many other issues. All that will be at stake in how we solve phase two. I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about it, and I think the president is too, actually. Thank you. We'll close it there on that note of very cautious optimism. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time, and thank you for contributing to the paper and being part of the group last fall. Many thanks to Mike uh, Pillsbury for being so candid with us, and many thanks to our great director, Anya Manuel. Um, before I introduce Secretary Rice and we have a conversation about these issues, I was remiss uh, in my opening remarks in not welcoming three distinguished ambassadors. Ambassador Vladimir Yelchenko, the ambassador of Ukraine, the new ambassador, is here. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the United States. And Amb Ambassador Martin Weiss of Austria is also here with us, Mr. Ambassador. And I believe Ambassador Marta Barsenia of Mexico is here. <laughs> Madam Ambassador, thank you. Um, as, as we have talked about, the Aspen Strategy Group began 36 years ago at the height of the Cold War when Condi and I were very young officials in the Reagan administration. And the intent was can people get away from Washington once a year in the summer and struggle with the big issues of the Cold War? Joe Nye, Brent Scowcroft, our dear friend, General Scowcroft, Sam Nunn, uh, Bill Perry were the four people who brought us together. And we are just their inheritors. We're dedicated to nonpartisanship. I know that's a radical concept in Washington, but we're dedicated to it. And Condi Rice has been a big part of this group since the 1980s, when she first went, I think that's in 1986. Right. That's right. Invited as a new face. Um, in the, in no the mid 80s, am. right? Yes, in the mid 80s, that's right. Yeah. And now she's our co chair. Um, I don't want to belabor her extraordinary life and career, but she's someone I deeply admire our, as our Secretary of State, as our National Security Advisor. When she was Special Assistant to President George H.W. Bush, uh, I was her deputy, and we worked together at the end of the Cold War. She is a professor at Stanford. Uh, she is an author. She's a speaker. She's a very patriotic American. So I wanted to pay tribute to our co-chair. Thank you. And then ask you, uh, ask you the first question, Condi. We, we listened to Mike and Anya. When President Trump came in um, with Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson in 2017, they made two big strategic pronouncements. In the National Security Strategy of 2017, they said, essentially, terrorism remains an abiding concern, but the rise and assertiveness of China and Russia are now the greatest threats we face. And that was also in Secretary Mattis's um, defense strategy report. Are you in agreement with their strategic judgment? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, Anya and Mike, thank you for really setting us up with a, a great. I have not read the agreement in Chinese, Mike, just to be, <laughs> to be clear. Tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. And, and Nick, thank you for your leadership. Um, I think whenever you have the reemergence of great power rivalry, and let me call it that, uh, it is a different kind of challenge than uh, the challenge of terrorism, uh, for instance, because great power rivalry brings with it uh, a whole array of tools on uh, the side of the other side, whether it's military power or economic might, and so it looks different. And I think, actually, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we thought we were done with great power rivalry. There was really a sense that uh, everybody was going to integrate into the Washington consensus. Everybody was going to integrate into something that at least looked like capitalism and maybe even democratic capitalism. 
Uh, the Russians seem to be very much on, on that path, and uh, there were those who believed that uh, by the integration of China into the international economy, we began to see the liberalization of Chinese politics. And so you said earlier uh, that the expectation had been cooperation with China. I actually think the expectation was integration with China. And now you see frustration uh, with that. And of course, the Russian and Chinese challenges are different. Uh, Russia is really a power without the full array of uh, assets. I mean, when is the last time you actually bought something that was made in Moscow uh, that was not made of petroleum? And uh, by the way, don't say vodka. You might buy that in France these days. And if you look at China, you have a rising power. But certainly, the emergence of great power rivalry is different uh, than what I think we thought we would be facing. And that's why I think uh, they rightly uh, noted this to be probably the greatest uh, national security challenge that we have. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the practical aspects of this, because I, I have a lot of sympathy. I'm sure you do, too, Steve does, to what the Trump administration is facing. On the one hand, we've got to work with China. Yeah eventually we're going to have to work on climate change or go back to working on stabilizing the global economy, resisting and containing pandemics, right. Right. a statement, right. a problem we're right that now. we're seeing yes. this week. On the other hand, they're our biggest strategic competitor. Uh, we've got a military battle underway, an ideas battle that we'll talk about. And then to get make it really complicated, and you dealt with this as Secretary of State, we disagree with them on Hong Kong and on Taiwan and on what's happening with the Uyghurs in Western China. How do you balance essential cooperation that we must have and essential competition? What gets priority and how do you weigh human rights in this? Yeah, the problem is that this uh, policy requires nuance. And um, Americans aren't particularly good at nuance. Uh, the Soviet Union was ideal in many ways. What was good for the Soviet Union was bad for the United States. What was bad for the United States was good for the Soviet Union. In fact, uh, at no time it was more than 1% of Soviet GDP accounted for by international trade. This was a completely isolated economy. It really didn't matter to the global economy. Uh, we had isolated it further through uh, restrictions through the COCOM system, meaning that they couldn't participate in the technological progress that was going on around the world. It was an isolated state. And by the way, it was self-isolating. Because uh, going all the way back to, this, to uh, Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union didn't want to integrate into the international system. Fast forward to China. The expectation was that somehow uh, everybody saw this big train coming down the tracks, uh, more than a billion people, an economy that was growing very rapidly. And they said, let's integrate that into the system rather than let it overrun, which is why, by the way, China was admitted to the WTO ahead of schedule when China had not yet conformed its laws and its practices to the WTO. One of my jobs as secretary was to go and explain to the Russians why they were not in the WTO and China was. And the only answer you could give was, well, because their economy matters. And so we had these expectations about China that have now been frustrated. And what concerns me is that the nuance, as you put it in your remarks, there will be an overreaction to our disappointment that our notion of how China would integrate wouldn't uh, quite pan out. So what we're going to have to do is to challenge where we need to challenge. Um, Mike gave a very good, I think, uh, overview of how we're challenging on freedom of navigation, coming right up to the line, but not challenging in a way that gets us into, yeah, the South, uh, China into South China Sea, into an accident. Uh, we're going to have to speak up when there are people in the streets in Hong Kong uh, about their rights. We're going to have to make sure that the Chinese understand that we have an obligation under the Taiwan Relations Act to help Taiwan defend itself should there be a unilateral provocation. Uh, we're going to have to uh, say to the Chinese, uh, and this is where I agree completely with the, uh, the Trump administration, uh, unfair trading practices under the false colors of you're still a developing country are simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable to steal intellectual property. It's not acceptable to privilege national champions over foreign competition. It's not acceptable to use your joint ventures to steal international uh, uh, intellectual property. It's not fair to have whole segments of your economy that are closed to foreign competition. And on that, we're going to call you. And I hope that in phase two, uh, 
because phase one um, didn't get at a lot of these practices for a lot of reasons. But eventually, Chinese industrial policy has got to be on the table because China is not playing by fair rules. It's a huge economy, and it does disadvantage others. So we're going to have to call it where we have to. Uh, when it comes to something like a pandemic, I would hope we're going to get the kind of cooperation that we need. Right. When it comes to climate change, we can't solve the climate problem without China being a part of that solution. Yeah. And frankly, on some issues like North Korea, uh, we're going to have to continue to deal with the China. So this is going to require uh, nuance and uh, divisibility of uh, the way that we deal with the China challenge. And that's hard. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Secretary Rice a few more questions. Then we're going to open it up. So if you would like to ask a question, we're on the record. Please just signal me. We'll take as many as we can. Let me stay with this for a minute. Um, we, you and I have worked together the practical aspects of this, which is really hard. Right. And I'm not trying to go back and cast judgment and ask you to cast judgment. Let's just go forward. No matter who gets elected in November, whether it's President Trump for a second term or a Democrat for a first term, should we go back to some version, 2021-22, of a TPP that was 40% of global trade of democratic free market countries they had weighed against China. And I actually agree, as I said, with President Trump's toughness on China. My own view is he would have been better off aligned with the EU and Japan on trade against China. Do we need to go back to have some weight in this fight with the Chinese on well, trade? Well, we, we, we certainly need to have a strategy that brings allies into our challenges with China. Let me just give you one example. Um, the technological decoupling that is taking place with China, and a technological decoupling is taking place. Whatever the United States, Japan, Europe, many India, whatever differences we might have about privacy and the internet, for instance, pales in comparison to our differences with China on issues of privacy. We really do have two internets, and it's going to have to be two because they're irreconcilable. Our internet is one where you can more or less say what you think, more or less talk to whom you please. Uh, within, within limits, you can um, see and view anything you want. It's a means of social control in China. Those two are irreconcilable. Surveillance state. The surveillance state. It, those are irreconcilable. We need our allies to recognize that we have more in common there than not. When you think about uh, trade policy, I would rather be aligned with others who have relatively open economies uh, when we say to the Chinese, you've got to change your industrial policy. But we have to be careful how we do it. Let's take Huawei as an example. Now, I would be a major proponent of not having Huawei in my 5G network. It is a Chinese company. It will do what it's told. But do I really want to say that you can't sell components to Huawei? Do I really want to say that they can't sell headsets? And am I now creating a situation in which I'm asking other countries to choose between the United States and their commercial interest in China? I think we have to be very careful how hard we push on some of these issues. But if we go back to what is it that we have in common to deal with this rising China, I, I think we're going to do better than on our own. And as you say, I think as, as all of us travel in East Asia, every single neighbor of China, no matter how friendly or allied they are with us, say, don't make us choose. Don't. Is that what you're worried about? That well, we're not going to succeed? Don't, at least don't make us choose uh, visibly and audibly. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the right incentives, people will choose uh, correctly. Uh, let me say one other thing about the rising China, though. Uh, there ought to be some room for looking for those moments when China's rise can be accommodated. And let me give you a very specific example. A few years ago, the Chinese came up with the idea of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Right? Uh, they were going around. They were telling everybody, we want to bid this to be by World Bank standards. They were hiring people from the World Bank. And I think that might have been, by the way, it was the Obama administration that opposed it. Uh, I think that might have been a moment to say to the Chinese, you know, that's a great idea. We all need infrastructure. Let's start in Afghanistan. Let's make it transparent. And it would have been a way to say to China, we're not trying to block your rise at every corner, because you are a rising power. 
but here's a healthy way to play in the international economy. Instead, we said, oh, nobody should join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It will compete with the Bretton Woods institutions. Nobody should join. And then the British joined. And when the British join, you're pretty much by yourself. And so we also need to look for those places where um, China's rise could be accommodated in, in a way that's actually useful in the international economy. Right. Um, on the, in the military sphere, Steve, Anya, you and I, and many others worked very closely in the George W. Bush administration to build up our strategic relationship with India. Yes. And we were cognizant of the fact that we have a distinct strategic advantage over China. We have allies, and the Chinese do not. Right. We started at kind of at the Assistant Secretary of State level, you'll remember this, a quad, Australia, Japan, India, India and the United States, talking, not wishing to fight China, just talking together about how we could enhance our political, right. foreign policy, and military cooperation. The Trump administration, to its credit, has elevated that at the, at the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense level. Is this how we should think about the strategic political and military cooperation that we've got, we should be tied up with our allies, not to fight the Chinese, but to limit them. And, and to pursue coincident interest. Right. So we all have an interest in freedom of navigation. Yeah. So we don't have to say fight China on freedom of navigation. We are supporting the principle of freedom of navigation, which is important to all of the countries that you mentioned. The other thing is to be, I think, a little bit careful how we describe such things. Australia is an ally. Japan is a treaty ally. The Indians are partners. We don't have to force the issue of people coming into formal alliance with us. Cooperation ought to be enough. And again, it comes to uh, kind of meeting these countries uh, where they are. Uh, I should go back. You asked about trying to get back into TPP. Let's remember that part of the problem here is that the no candidate in the 2016 election, including the Secretary of State who had negotiated it. Secretary Clinton. Right. Yeah supported the TPP. True. And that tells you something about where trade is in the American firmament. Um, I personally was very pleased to see that some of the tougher things that were said about uh, NAFTA, worst agreement in history by the president when he came in, uh, we actually did get um, a US-Mexico-Canada agreement. So. Um, we may have to do this in a way that doesn't go back and try to pick up where we where we were, but actually uh, take some of these things on anew. And I, I think if you could look at Asia again, you would want something like the TPP, but I don't think it's going to be the TPP. Well, I agree with you. And I think trade is such a difficult issue in both political parties. And yet, for those of us who think about our strategic weight, this T some successor in the next decade to TPP could be what we need to unite the democratic world on these trade issues. Well, it may well be, but uh, I think we're going to have to take this one step at a time mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know, it may be that a series of bilateral treaties uh, are going to be, or trilateral as in the case with uh, Mexico and Canada, uh, possibly with Europe. Uh, let's just, I think we're going to have to build it out. I'm not sure that the big multilateral trade agreements um, have much of a future, at least in the short term. OK. Uh, two more questions. Um, one's a question I think that every administration from the Clinton administration on, including this one, Trump, have dealt with. How do we balance all these competing objectives? We started with this, but I want to just ask your common sense approach. We need them on climate change. We need them on the global economy. We need them on pandemics. And yet they're our strongest competitor. We need to compete. Yeah. So can we keep these competing interests in some relative balance and be successful? Well, you know, Nick, that actually what you end up doing is you end up balancing every day. Yeah. Uh, you go to China, and you're going to bring up the human rights issues, and you're going to bring up religious freedom issues. And then you're going to sit down, and you're going to have a conversation about North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, China is a grown-up country, uh, and they are quite aware that the United States is going to raise uh, these issues. Occasionally, you're going to, as Secretary of State, raise issues of religious objectors or human rights issues, and you're going to get someplace. Uh, and as long as you do it in a respectful way, I don't think it has to undermine other areas in which we have to cooperate. But I don't think we buy anything by pretending that we don't care about uh, what's happening to the Uyghurs in China. I don't think we get anywhere.
uh, pretending that we don't care about uh, social control on, uh, of the internet. And so uh, it is a balancing act every day, but I think it can be managed, and I think the Chinese understand it. Thank you. Last question, then we're going to open it up to all of you. Um, when I left our meeting uh, in August, after three, day, three and a half days of real debate and discussion, very civil, but tough-minded in some mm -hmm. cases, I was left with the thought that despite China's prodigious strengths, we shouldn't forget our own. Right. We're a strong country, militarily, economically, politically, our soft power, our private sector. And sometimes we forget that. So it's kind of a softball to my friend here. Here it is. I interviewed Secretary Rice two years ago, and um, I asked her the following question. What are you worried about? And I thought I was asking you, are you worried about Xi Jinping, Putin, or Erdogan? And without missing a beat, you said, we've lost our self-confidence. And you meant that not in a political way. You meant as a country. As a country. Have we lost the self-confidence that America can do great things, and we can compete with China. Right. Uh, Talk it, about that. I like going back sometimes and read, reading Ronald Reagan, because his uh, acceptance of challenges, whether, whether it was the Soviet Union, and the, was always on the basis of America's strengths. And uh, it's very important that we recognize that, yes, China is a rising power and all that, but China has a lot of demerits. Uh, you think about the demographic bomb. Uh, that they face. And by the way, you can get into authoritarian envy. You know, authoritarians can get things done. Look at the great airports they build. Oh my goodness, they build roads. You can build an airport in China in the time that it takes to get a permit to be a hairdresser in the United States. I've heard it, right? Now, this is all true, but authoritarians also make bad decisions efficiently. So a few years ago, they decided in China that uh, population control was a problem, and now we have a one-child policy, efficiently, even brutally carried out, and now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. So the problem with authoritarians is, if you're going to be omnipotent, you better be omniscient too. And most human beings are not. And so authoritarians make a lot of mistakes. We stumble around as democracies, and we have all kinds of voices, and it's tough to get things done, but we make fewer, bigger mistakes. And so we need to look back at what are our strengths. And I will give you three that I think the China challenge could cause us to undermine. The first is, I understand China has a national AI strategy. They have a national quantum computing strategy. They have a national, please, let's not have a national US strategy. We have always succeeded because we have multiple places at which innovation takes place. It might be the person who sits in a garage and comes up with something that nobody else has ever thought of. And when it gets pushed from the top down, it will not work in the United States. I don't think it will work in China, but it surely won't work in the United States. So let's not try to out-China China. I don't mind uh, that we have fora to discuss how we can put all of our strengths together, but something driven out of Washington will not work. And I'll give you a very good example. Our friend Bill Perry said that when he was undersecretary for research and engineering, he testified in the Congress in um, 1978 or 1979, and he was asked, um, what is the future of personal computing? And he said, there's no reason for personal computers. Right? That's Bill Perry, one of the most technologically sophisticated people that I know. Now, if the need for personal computers had been driven from Washington, we might not have had them. So let's not try to have a national strategy on things. Let's, let's go to our strengths. Second point the openness of our society. I have watched as pressure is growing on universities uh, not to admit Chinese students to our frontier laboratories, places like Stanford and MIT and Texas at Austin and Harvard. Illinois and Harvard. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I meant to mention Harvard. That was... Uh, it's just what oversight, uh, but but I remember um, that. But I, I you hear this, and I want to say, and I have said to uh, U.S. government agencies, don't try to turn universities into intelligence agencies. 
If you know somebody is working for the PLA, don't give them a visa and we won't admit them. But if you start to undermine the openness that is the core of universities, you've got to have a clash between universities and the government. And universities have been at the heart of innovation in this country, the Silicon Valley, Route 128. Uh, the research triangle uh, in North Carolina, Austin. And so let's not undermine that. And then the final one that I hope we uh, will not undermine is we have been a place where the best and the brightest have wanted to come because it really didn't matter where you came from, it mattered where you were going. You could come from humble circumstances and you could do great things. But the key to that was always a high quality education. And the Chinese can do nothing worse to us than what we're doing with the state of K-12 education in the United States today. And so unless those kids believe that they have a chance to participate, and oh, by the way, that was a, a dream that was taken, by, taken up by immigrants as well. I remember sitting with Lee Kuan Yew at a uh, dinner, and um, he said, do you know why the United States will always lead? He said, because you know, if you're a young software engineer, you might want to go to Germany, you might want to go to uh, Japan. You can never be really German or Japanese. He said, you can go to the United States, you can be American pretty much on day one. And be CEO. And be CEO. And so uh, if we refocus on our strengths, I don't think there's a country in the world that can ultimately compete with us. But if we take a page from their book instead uh, and try to replicate what they do, we'll fail at it. And that's how they, how they will succeed. So it's why I've always said it's our confidence that I think is actually our greatest challenge. Well, needless to say, I think the entire group here is in agreement with you. It's beautifully said. Um, in our red-blue, north-south, liberal-conservative divide, we don't talk enough about our strengths. And last evening, General Jim Mattis, and we all admire, is, is now a senior counselor at the Cohen Group, and Secretary Cohen uh, offered a dinner. And General Mattis talks exactly the way that you do. He said the following, just one more thing yeah. before we go to questions. He said, the United States has two powers in the world. We have the power of intimidation. That's right. the Marine Corps and the Army and the Navy, the Air Force. He said, we have the power of inspiration. And General Mattis says, that's the power. Yeah. That's the secret sauce right. of the United States. That's it's, what you're saying. It's, that's absolutely the secret sauce of the United States. If you go around the world, uh, people are, are grateful um, for our economy, which drives a lot of the world economy. Uh, they're really sometimes a, a little intimidated. But, but frankly, when there's hard work to be done, the fact that we have men and women in uniform who volunteer to go to the front lines of freedom is appreci appreciated by people. But what really is appreciated is this central notion about the United States that uh, you can come from humble circumstances and you can do great things. And uh, to the degree that people begin, we as Americans no longer believe that true, because for too many of our citizens, it's really not true any longer. Uh, when I can look at your zip code and tell if you're going to get a good education, I can't really say it doesn't matter where you came from. It matters where you're going. So here I think that, you know, I wouldn't use the language uh, that the president has used about America first and so forth and so on. But I think that there was a bit of a lesson in the 2016 election for those of us who have been part of the globalizing elite and have been captured with the idea that this integrating globalizing world would lift everybody. And the 2016 election in that sense was a little bit of a wake up call because people were saying, do you hear me now? I'm actually not doing that well out here. And if I'm not doing that well out here, I don't wanna hear your stories about uh, the global commons. I don't want to hear your stories about America's responsibility for the global commons. I want you to come back here and tell me how I'm going to deal with the fact that I have no skills, that my kids aren't well educated. Yes, in that sense, the president uh, is right. Uh, turning to our challenges here is a part of making us confident again so that we can lead out there. Because I will say one thing. A world that the United States abdicates leadership is not going to be a world in which our allies who share our values step up 
to the plate. It's either going to be a world in which those who don't share our values try to step up to the plate, or where nobody does. And then you've got uh, the chaos and the Hobbes and jungle um, that uh, we saw play out in World War I and World War II until the United States and its allies decided that there was a better way. Thank you very much. Um, questions and comments for, for Secretary Rice? Yes, sir. We'll have a microphone coming. Lynn Matisse, National Economic Security Alliance. Uh, Secretary Rice, how do we counter activities that we see the Chinese uh, very heavily engaged in where they're overtaking control over dramatic raw materials that we need in, in uh, uh, ports around the world where our military is concerned that we're not going to be able to go into these environments because the Chinese will block us out of them? And then the latest thing that we saw in Australia where they tried to buy a guy to go and get involved in elections is starting getting engaged yeah. in that kind yeah. of thing. We're going to see more and more of that by their activity around the world. How do we counter that? Uh, absolutely. And, and first of all, I'm glad you brought up the election issues because we've all been very focused on the Russians, but I'm told that the Chinese are as big a problem, if not a bigger problem. And uh, so part of it is actually getting our act together and doing something about it. Now, one of the problems we have is that the infrastructure is not owned by the US government. It's owned privately. So when we learned that the Russians were doing what they were doing through Facebook, for instance, uh, it w we needed better cooperation between the intelligence agencies and the private sector. And the level of trust is not very high between the private sector, particularly where I live in Silicon Valley, and the government. But we need that kind of cooperation if we're going to respond to these kinds of, of issues. When you look at the Belt and Road strategy, uh, loan to own, um, the idea that the Chinese will uh, go in and, and uh, give financing for a port or for an infrastructure project, and then when the country can't pay it back, the Chinese somehow own control of it. I think you publicize it. Right? I don't think this works very well in the 21st century. I think actually if it's really well known exactly what they're doing, you're going to start seeing countries have to respond to that. And by the way, in some African countries, where the standards, the environmental standards, where the uh, health and safety standards have caused major accidents in mines and the like, that needs to see the light of day. Sometimes truth is your best option as propaganda. And uh, one of the most effective things that we did was the, uh, the Chinese used to essentially lie about the uh, pollution standard, uh, the, the, the level of pollution in uh, Beijing. And our embassy put out uh, a, a barometer that actually measured the particulates. And then pretty soon, Chinese citizens were getting their own little app that would tell them what the air quality really was. And the government had to stop lying about it. So I think sometimes we uh, don't use the ability to expose some of these uh, activities and put some pressure on these countries not to sign on to bad deals. And we don't need to mimic Belt and Road, but there is the Build Act, and it has bipartisan yeah. support. Democrats and Republicans support it. That's something else we can do. Well, and, and I think it has the right strategy, which is what you really want people to do is to uh, have systems that can incent private investment. Because we are never going to be able, we, look, we, we can't build a, you know, infrastructure between Nebraska and Kansas. So we're not going to build worldwide infrastructure. But what we can do is incent these countries to have high enough standards. Um, the, the president of Liberia told President Bush once, um, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, she said, I really want American companies in here. And uh, he said, why? She said, because you have something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so I know when my minister signs an agreement, then that's where that's going to that project. Because So we have something that we can demonstrate to countries that are looking for, for help. Secretary Cohen, and the mic will come right to you. Secretary, thank you very much for a brilliant uh, presentation, brilliant questions as well. Um, President Trump uh, is renowned as a businessman. Mike Pillsbury talked about this, how he approaches things. He is approaching foreign policy uh, in a business-like fashion. 
Uh, he wants to put a, a cost-benefit analysis on many of our relationships, including the military, where it appears that we, uh, you get us if you pay, and if you don't pay, you don't go, we don't go. Uh, but in terms of foreign policy, where he's looking, saying, why do we need to be in Japan? Why do we need to be in South Korea? Why are we still in Germany? How does that philosophy fit into what you were just saying, that if we're withdrawing because they're not paying up, there's no return on investment, how does that keep us engaged uh, in being the player on the global scene that is uh, continuing to secure peace and security? Well, well, all of us who've done this, and you know this, first of all, transactional foreign policy is kind of hard, right? I do this, you do that. It, really doesn't work that way. You build larger relationships and so forth. But we also know that all of us went around the world telling them to pay up. Not so much the Asians. I mean, not so much South Korea and Japan, where I think actually, if you look at the um, actual numbers, we do pretty well. But how many times, Bill, did you give the speech at NATO? Or did I give the speech at NATO? Or did our presidents give the speech at NATO? How about that 2%, right? And so I don't really blame the president for saying in to NATO, you, you want our support. I, I probably wouldn't have threatened not to, you know, not to defend them. Uh, but it, maybe you need to get people's um, attention on some of these. But, I, but the core of your question is, I think transactional foreign policy is hard, and, and actually, um, if you look at the American alliance structures, I, as you probably have, I spoke for the, the National War College a couple years ago uh, for their exchange program with officers, and there were 49 countries represented in that room. 49 countries. What great power in human history has had 49 allies? And yes, they can be frustrating, and yes, sometimes they don't. But you know, when it comes right down to it, um, I think you would rather have allies than not. And sometimes if you're the big power, you may have to put up with a little bit more uh, than you would like. Uh, so I would, I would caution against transactions, but I have to say on NATO, I was in there cheering him all the way. <laughs> and yet I have, I'm compelled to say this as a former ambassador to NATO. <laughs> um, I want to, on 9-11. Yeah, it was good to have friends. When we were really hit hard, I called the secretary from Brussels and said, I, the national security advisor, Rice from Brussels, and said the Allies want to invoke Article 5 for the first time in NATO history. And, in, and you said to me, I, I needed instructions from yeah. you and the president to agree to it. You said? I said it's good to have friends. Um, it is. Tell them that. And you know, ironically, yeah. Article 5 never had been Invoked. invoked, and we always assumed that it would yeah. be invoked on behalf of, and, and by the way, because we really didn't actually have a command for the United States, we were actually dependent in those early hours on NORAD. Yeah. So uh, the allies stepped up for us there, uh, but we could still get better contributions. And the allies, <laughs> <laughs> we've had a 30 year dialogue, and the allies yeah. went into Afghanistan and has suffered yeah. a thousand combat yeah. deaths. That's right and several thousand allies, Europeans, Canadians, right. Japanese, yes. New Zealanders, Australians. It's been an incredible show of support. And that's the force, that's the difference between us and the authoritarian well, powers, it, right? It's also the case that, um, and, and I, I said with NATO with the paying up, but, but let's also remember that NATO had an extraordinary role at the end of the Cold War in uh, helping the countries of Eastern Europe find a kind of North Star for democratic development. So the twin of the European Union uh, North Star and the NATO North Star, we got civil military reform in a lot of these countries. A lot of people worried, you know, will Bulgaria and Turkey uh, go into conflict? Will Romania and Hungary have conflict? And actually, I think the NATO relationships helped to smooth uh, that transition. So it's, it's been an incredibly valuable uh, alliance. It still does need more in the way of transformation, and uh, that does take money. Okay. Um, we have time maybe for two more questions. Uh, Nyma Green is a PhD student, Nyma Green Riley, at Harvard University, but she's a Stanford undergrad, I, I and a that, former yes. student <laughs> of Secretary Rice, and a former student of mine. And Nyma joined us this past summer at Aspen. Uh, 
and she was a compelling speaker. So now the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. I want to talk about something that ha happened after Aspen. So in October, we saw the um, Houston Rockets controversy where the general manager of the Houston Rockets tweeted um, something in support of Hong Kong protesters right. while the team was in China. Right. And um, I think that the response to that entire controversy was lacking, right? I yeah. never saw anyone from the US government really stand up for rights or for um, freedom of speech or things like that. So we're talking about the war of ideas. And I wonder what you would say, Secretary um, Rice, about what the appropriate response to an incident like that with China would be. Right, yes, and uh, for those of you who uh, didn't or uh, forgotten what the um, general manager of the Houston Rockets uh, tweeted, basically, support for the Hong Kong uh, demonstrators, uh, the Chinese madly overreacted, including canceling uh, games and all kinds of things, and the NBA, and I'm a great fan of Adam Silver, but he, the Silver, but the initial response uh, was not strong enough. Eventually, the NBA came and said, "We support the rights of our people to say what they wish to say." I probably would have said to the Chinese, maybe quietly, "You're always telling us not to interfere in your internal affairs. Telling an American what to say is interfering in our internal affairs. Americans get to say what they wish." And I actually thought that the NBA was in a stronger position than they realized because um, the NBA is wildly popular in China. And uh, it's not just Yao Ming, who was the great Chinese player. It's because they love the sport in China. And if the Chinese threatened to take the NBA off the air, I would say, be my guest. And let's see how long it is before all those only child princelings <laughs> are satisfied watching the Chinese national team play the Kazakh national team, right? So um, I actually think the NBA was in a stronger position and sometimes you have to force the issue. Don't be so diplomatic, <laughs> Madam Secretary. I'm no longer Secretary of State. I can <laughs> Please. And the, and the mic will come right to you. It'll just take about 10 seconds. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ying Wang. I'm a big admirer of Secretary of State. And uh, um, I, I'm an American citizen. I originally worked in the Chinese government. Uh, I was a Mason Fellow at Kennedy School. Uh, I want to mention that uh, every Chinese government official, every business CEO, every wealthy family in China, they want to send their only child or <laughs> the second child to America. Now to high school, and then to college, and then to higher you know, degrees. That is a fact. And secondly, there is a alumni, Kennedy School alumni and in China. I think in the past that there is a training uh, program between the Chinese, uh, some organizations and the Kennedy School. I think that some of them already reach ministerial level. And uh, though they cannot say certain things, but within the decision making uh, category, they are very powerful. And also, uh, there's a lot of resentment in China among the people, among the local government officials on the belt and the road policy. Because where does China get enough money to continue? And why you don't spend the money for poor regions in China? That's it, thank yes. you. Thank you very much. And may I just say a, a, a point about, uh, your point about Chinese students coming here. You know, I, I recognize fully that we face certain challenges with uh, some Chinese students who uh, may come here, learn certain things, and go, go back home, and uh, that people consider it a kind of un unforced error in terms of technology transfer. I understand that. Um, I also understand that I want Chinese students to experience the United States. I want them to experience what it is like to study in a place where you can study what you want, when you want. 
Uh, one of uh, the Chinese students that I know at Stanford uh, was asked, uh, well, what was the thing that impressed you most about the internet? And she said, I could read anything I wanted to. Right? I, I think we sometimes, it goes to your point, we don't completely understand the power of an open society. And uh, I understand we face these challenges, but I certainly hope it doesn't uh, take the form of cutting ourselves off from generations of Chinese uh, students who I think would be, we will be better served if they've had the chance to be here. Boy, is that an important point, and I would just make a prediction. I completely agree, I'm a college professor as well with Secretary Rice. I think there's gonna be a big debate between those of us on university campuses who see the power of our inspiration and some of the national security community or in Congress who want to legislate that certain students from certain countries can't come here. Mm -hmm. And we got to have an open discussion, but it's, it's, it's right in front of us. Right, absolutely. Madam Secretary, you've got to leave. Do you want any parting words of wisdom to give us some hope here? <laughs> Well, my parting, wisdom, parting word of wisdom is that um, I think we will get through our challenges. And uh, the United States of America, you know, people say the American people are tired. Um, and uh, didn't we defeat the Soviet Union? Didn't we unify Germany? Didn't we liberate Eastern Europe? Didn't we defeat at least the Al Qaeda that did 9-11? And uh, can't somebody else do this? And Steve will remember, we were in the Oval Office in August of 2008. And uh, President Bush was looking at some polls that were not so kind to the Bush administration. And he said, oh, I don't believe we are this unpopular. I said, you know, Mr. President, they're tired of us. They're tired of us. It's been uh, war. It's been terrorism. It's been vigilance. They're tired of us. I did say I'm tired of them, too. But in any case, um, I know that there is um, a kind of weariness with world leadership. Uh, but I also think that Americans carry two sometimes contradictory notions in their heads. We're tired, we want somebody else to do that. But if there's nobody else to do it, I'm not gonna watch people beheaded on television by ISIS. I'm not gonna watch, and President Trump said this, I'm not gonna watch Syrian children choking on nerve gas. I'm not gonna watch as Vladimir Putin threatens the Baltic states. So I'm actually gonna put heavy brigades. And I'm gonna to say to, to the Russians, you might have to kill an American to, to get to them, which is, by the way, always the way NATO operated. And so I think an American president can actually determine which of those impulses he or she wishes to stimulate in the American people. And given how much we have benefited from an international system that at least in the half that we were able to, uh, to, to be more dominant in, really believed in our values and helped us to carry out our interest, I hope that American presidents, as we talk about all the problems that we need to solve at home so that we can be strong enough at home, but that we won't lose sight of uh, the extraordinary last 75 years or so and what we've achieved. Thank you for reminding us what made us great. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you. So we're going to continue this conversation. And my thanks to Secretary Rice for being with us. Um, we're going to continue this conversation with two 15-minute discussions with two really smart people. Um, we're nonpartisan, but obviously we have Democrats and Republicans in our group. You just heard from two Republicans, Mike Pillsbury, Condoleezza Rice. You're now going to hear from two Democrats. Kath Hicks, Kathleen Hicks, and Kirk Campbell. Um, Kath Hicks is not the household name that Condi Rice is, but in my humble estimation, you're gonna hear a lot more from her in the future. <laughs>
Uh, Kath is right now the Henry A. Kissinger Se Senior Vice President at CSIS, the Center for Strategic International Studies, and the Henry A. Kissinger Chair. And she was a senior official in the Obama administration as Deputy Undersecretary of State. And she was in charge of our strategic planning. And I think she's one of the smartest people in Washington in thinking about how America positions itself to retain our strategic pre predominance. Both in NATO, we have two ambassadors from, from Europe here, of Ukraine and Austria. And also just around the world, we have the ambassador of Mexico here. So it's really a pleasure to have Kath here. There's a chapter in the book that Kath has written. And Kath, I want to talk to you about the military challenges we face. And just to remind you, we have a former Secretary of Defense right in front of us who has the right to kibitz if he wishes to kibitz on these issues. Um, we've spent the last two years at the Aspen Strategy Group focused on two issues. Issue number one, how do we, working with Australia, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and especially India, make sure that there's a weight in the Indo-Pacific of free and democratic countries, most of those countries free and democratic, uh, to limit China's military ambitions. The other thing we've talked about two years ago was this huge competition that's on us for the military technology of the future in the digital age, AI, quantum computing, biotech, machine learning. So are, uh, just to open this up, are you confident that the engineering and R&D talent in our universities and tech companies and the strength of the Pentagon uh, to do long-range planning that we can not just compete with the Chinese but retain our predominance? Or do you think that's at risk? Well, Nick, first, thanks for having me here. <clears throat> and I want to thank my co-author who's here with me, Joe Federici. Um, so to, to answer your question, yes, I'm confident we can compete and succeed. I am not confident we are undertaking the whole of nation effort required to do that. So that includes things like smart immigration policy, some of what um, Secretary Rice and you were speaking Engineers about. Engineers to the United Engineers. States. Engineers, we're not going to grow, uh, you know, organically from inside the United States. This in a, in a pace we need, the STEM workforce that we need, we have to rely um, on immigrants, and we have to incent them to stay. Um, just as the United States is tightening its immigration policies, for instance, the Chinese have opened up their STEM-related um, immigration from ASEAN nations, a uh, perfect counterplay to the way the U.S. is approaching this challenge set. We have to invest federal R&D dollars, even though our, we are not China, we are not a state-run economy. There's going to have to be much more um, incentives rather than dollars directly from the federal government to create inside industry avenues of approach in the areas of emerging technology that you've just mentioned and others, and, and create incentives for them to work with the Defense Department. But also we have to live our values, very much what you all have talked about. People have to want to work with the Defense Department. We have to demonstrate that the United States and China are not morally equivalent today. Uh, we don't spy on our citizens. We aren't using facial recognition software everywhere. We aren't in putting them in encampments like the Chinese are doing with Uyghurs. But we do have to make an affirmative case to the American people, particularly in a day and age when most people haven't had military service or national service of any kind, when social media makes it so easy to pull into your own community, that there is a commonality and a purpose to patriotism. Thank you. And in your paper in the book, and if you look at Kath's uh, and Joe's chapter, uh, you talk about gray zone operations, but you also talk about the multiplicity of challenges that we face. Obviously, we're facing a competition for naval supremacy in the South and East China Sea, going all the way out to the second island chain. We're talking about air superiority, but we're talking about cyber mm -hmm. superiority and assets in space. Uh, tell us, educate us, if you will, uh, about the, the full realm of threats that we're facing and how best can we respond. Sure. Um, you're right. The way I would put it most easily, perhaps, is that the Chinese and Russians, they're, they're different, but they both have a fluidity working from uh, what you might call routine statecraft scaled up to um, the, the way they think about strategic nuclear, for instance, capabilities and everything in between, that we are not yet, we don't know how to uh, similarly move fluidly across them. It's creating a lot of challenges for us. So we set up a toolkit that's capable down at the diplomacy end, although we're having trouble 
right now in the State Department because we don't have ambassadors and people are leaving. And, and then at the higher end, we have the high end, if you will, military piece that I'm going to come to. But in the middle, as you point out, there are all these other tactics that are being used. And our toolkit right now is, is a little bare. We have sanctions. We have diplomacy, basically sanctions, and military power. That's what we like to lean into. Uh, whereas these other actors are really good about including information and cyber approaches, disinformation, et cetera. So when I get to the high end, the biggest challenge the United States faces, we don't currently have concepts of operation that effectively marry the way in which we, the, the theory of victory, I think is how I'd put it, the, the, how we expect the Chinese to fight and how the United States could be capable all along that spectrum of achieving its strategic interests despite that. And that requires weaving across things like space that we're very reliant on in the military realm, of course, but also our commercial sector is highly reliant on space access. Uh, cyber, as you pointed out, where we, again, both have military requirements, but also a lot of threats that could face the homeland uh, in terms of coercion over cyber, and on and on. So it's the, it's the concept of operations, and it's building out the capabilities. For the Defense Department, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is always managing that top line of investment against the um, pressure of continuing year over year legacy system investments versus creating some room here for research and development in these new technology areas and then having concepts effectively marrying that into capabilities. So I want to ask you two questions, and I want to open it up. And I know we have Professor David Shambaugh here. David was a key part of our meetings and is a graduate school classmate of mine, but also at Johns Hopkins, but also a great scholar of China. Jay, I want to bring you into this conversation in a minute. But Kath, um, one of the things that we discovered at the Aspen Strategy Group in our report two years ago on technology in the digital age, a number of real experts told us the following, that within 10 to 20 years, the military technologies that we visualize as representing power, a carrier, an F-35, might be outmoded, that we might be in a situation of 100 years ago when the Russians and Poles rode into the First World War on horseback, and then the tank and aircraft appeared for the first time in global history on the battlefield. Can you envision by 2035 that we're going to be in that kind of a world, that the fight's going to be in space, and the fight's going to be in cyberspace, and not really much on land and sea. Is that where we're heading? I think that might be too deterministic. Uh, the answer is we don't quite know, and neither did folks in prior generations. So, there, there, so this is about how you manage investment and where you make your bets. What are your blue chips? What are your um, high return, low investment? Where are the foolish stocks in here? And so that requires a continual assessment. My answer to you uh, is the, real the hard reality is that the United States basically has bought a lot of its structure already for the next 10 years. So people who say we got to get rid of carriers, I have. Uh, We're uh, building carriers. We have carriers. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it will cost you a lot of money to decommission them. So I yeah. think there's a lot of myth busting to be done about the speed with which you can drastically shift without a significant investment flow coming in, which something like a major war or something would drive. I don't anticipate that. I think instead what we need to be focused on is this idea of rapid experimentation and prototyping. Things like unmanned systems that have been around literally for decades that we know the, how the systems work. We know we can do more of them. We know we can do it cheaper. And using advantages like AI, artificial intelligence, that can help you net those kinds of capabilities, you have to test those things in the battlefields. You have to exercise with them with your allies in the Pacific. And then you need to start focusing on what's that investment stream and what can I, die, my point earlier, divest from um, that grows, that allows me to grow those more relevant capabilities. Space and cyber absolutely will be essential. Space is extremely expensive as well, I'll point out, so it takes a big, a big chunk of money. But these other areas, I absolutely would be the last one to say we're not going to ever have to worry about wars on the ground or, uh, you know, maritime challenges. Those things continue. We just have to be ahead of the curve in, in the way in which they're evolving. So here's a question for Democrats and Republicans. Uh, whether it, President Trump has a second term or whether 
Vice President Biden as the president, whatever happens, do we have sufficient political will to meet this challenge? Some of the people who have come to our meetings, I mean, serious scientists, tech people say, we need a moonshot. We need to treat this problem of competition with China the way we treated from Sputnik on the competition with the Soviet Union. Is it, does it reach that level? In your I judgment? Think, I do think the overall competition has reached that level. We're smart to do that now. It's just that that moonshot is not going to be a widget. It is not going to be primarily military, although it has significant military elements. I think it's going to be overall about the, the competitiveness of our economy, our military, and our foreign policy. The alliance network, of course, I know you've hit this several times today, but bears repeating. Biggest strategic advantage we have for markets, for market share if we want to compete with China, and obviously on the military side. We have more dollars, more you know, troops, Australia. more capability Man. together. Um, and again, if the research base, as it is already internationalized, whether you're talking about biotech, AI, whatever, whatever area, robotics, um, all of that is being built in Germany. It's in you, certainly in the US, but also Germany, Canada, Australia, Japan. Let's actually leverage all of that and think strategically about the advantages that gains us so that we can have a way of um, engaging China effectively. Thank you um, very much. I just got the two minute warning. Uh, we'll make it three minute warning. I wanna ask Professor Shambaugh, David, who was a major part of our deliberations and has written a paper for the book that you all have in front of you. David, how do you, you, you understand China and you study the Chinese. How do you react to Cass' presentation and what's the probability for both of you <clears throat> that the United States ends up either keeping par or maintaining our predominance and what's the probability that on the other side that China outpaces us? Well, thank you, Nick. You kind of put me on the spot, but that's it's okay. <laughs> that's the way it is. You I can guess. handle it. Um, well, I don't disagree with anything uh, Kath has has just said. My own contribution to the volume you can all read for yourselves. I would just add one other dimension. I, I would note, first of all, a competition. I argue in my chapter is not an illicit concept or a dirty word. We need to embrace it. We need to get on with it. It's comprehensive across multiple domains. Kath has just spoken of several of those domains more in the security sphere. The only thing I'd like to add is that, to my mind, um, one domain that's going to be crucial is the information domain, by which I don't mean cyber. I mean information, good old-fashioned public diplomacy. And it goes back to what Secretary Rice was, and, and you were talking about, Nick, in terms of the competition of ideas. Um, that is at, at bottom for me. Yes, it's going to play out in security, economics, diplomacy, other sphere technology, but at the end of the day, it's going to be about the efficacy of our own values, our own system, um, and what we stand for. So we've got to go on offense in the PD realm, and we need Public to diplomacy. go on um, defense against China's own influence activities worldwide. They are trying to control the global narrative about their country and other issues. So this is a very complex area. It's not exactly gray zone in military terms. It's a new domain, though, of uh, diplomacy. PD, public diplomacy is an old domain, but we need to resurrect it, maybe recreate the US Information Agency. Uh, and compete head on with the Chinese in the information space and, and be self-confident. That's where the previous conversation, I think, is also very relevant. So that I would simply add to, to what you said. Thank you, David. Kath, a concluding remark from you, just listening to David. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an all-of-government approach. David's brought in public diplomacy, Edward R. Murrow, what we did during the Second World War and the Cold War. Completely agree with him, and actually our paper does include that in our review of both what the tactics are from adversaries, in this case China, and, and disinformation, and the use of information, which by the way, in particular for the Chinese, economics is a big, economic coercion is a big piece of how they are able to push disinformation or information and narrative. Um, and the US side, huge um, piece. I completely agree with David. One of our three key areas to reinvest the United States in, those being information, more on cyber capabilities, and economic incentives. 
Um, whether USIA is the right answer, I think deserves study, but I think the point is well made that we have to have an affirmative narrative and our actions have to follow our words. The only thing I would add is one of the key aspects of the environment we live in, especially the information environment, is the, the division between international and domestic is very blurry and nowhere more than in the information space. And here's where you need to not look just at state and public diplomacy. You need to be thinking about what is our approach, for example, through DHS or elsewhere in the government for sharing accurate and truthful information with the American people to combat misinformation. To the extent that that's already affecting elections as it has in the past and as the FBI director has said, we will be facing here in 2020. We know that's right at the heart of our core interests. Our democratic institutions are at risk. So whether that threat manifests clearly abroad or is foreign influenced and manifests here or is from a, you know, a fringe group that's domestically based, we need to have a way to protect our society. So you can see the um, competence and the depth of our public servants in Kath Hicks. Thank you, Kath, very much for being with us. So um, we promised that we would, we would uh, close by to C-SPAN, 2 o'clock. Uh, we have one more conversation. And it's with someone, uh, I just want to say one word about my friend, Kurt Campbell. Uh, we've been working together off and on and friends for 30 years. If there's anyone in the United States who's thought more deeply about our strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific um, than Kurt, I don't know who that person is. And someone who's a strong proponent of American power, but smart power. Uh, and Kurt has spent his life thinking about this competition, and I'm glad he's on our side. So Anya and Kurt. Thank you. All right, we're down to the last of our, but very much not least, of our rapid fire conversations, and we couldn't imagine anyone better to do it with than you. Kurt Campbell, again, Secretary. needs no introduction. He was the Assistant Secretary of State for Asia for Obama, the author of The Pivot, which was later renamed. We won't heckle you on that one. And slightly less well known, Kurt also was the first person to get me involved in the Aspen Strategy Group when I was um, a mere kid. So thank you very much for that and for being so inclusive. Let me start for you the same question I asked Mike, I think I know what you're going to say, but I'd like to ask you anyways. If we had a democratic administration, mm -hmm. what would the goals be for our relationship with China? What does a perfect relationship with China look like? So thank you, Annie. And if you don't mind, I do want to just say a word of thanks, uh, not only to Nick, who incredibly ably leads uh, the Aspen Strategy Group with your assistance, but um, there is a whole team behind him, and I'm sure you're going to have a minute to say so, to say thanks to them, but for putting this together. So I'm, I'm grateful to them. And um, Anya, I, I would say simply, I, I think um, one of the points that people often make right now, which I think is probably um, inaccurate, is that one of the areas of bipartisan support or agreement is a general acknowledgement that you know uh, that we're going to work together in a bipartisan way on China. I, I'm not sure that's exactly right. I think there is a general dissatisfaction across bipartisan lines about elements of the U.S.-China relationship, um, and there are some bromides that people say about working with allies and finding areas where we can compete smartly and understand where we draw lines. But in fact, I think we're at the actually the very earliest stages of thinking about a comprehensive strategy towards China. And that is often obscured by, I think, relatively simple rhetoric about the, com the complexities of the China challenge and, and really the challenge of a rising Asia. And part of that is, you know, rarely has a country gone on such a strategic detour as we have gone on. And, um, you know, we're at a period what do you mean right by strategic detour? Well, I mean, and you think I, the Chinese have or we have? No, we, we have essentially been focused and preoccupied away from Asia fundamentally for the last 20 years. That's one of the reasons we are so grateful for Nick and Condi and 
Joe convening the, the group uh, about and thinking about China and Asia. But I think much of our strategic elite has been focused a lot on Afghanistan, on Iraq, on Iran and Pakistan. And I think probably um, China's attitude on that would be something along the lines of, you go girl, this is so important. You focus on these issues, we'll work on Asia, and then in 20 years, we'll sit down and talk about the way things are going. And so now we're, we're in many respects, Ani, we're, we're in a big catch up period. And so I, you know, we, a lot of things came out of the, our summer session, but I, I think that at the core is a recognition that the United States is gonna have to do more across the board quickly. So it's a period of incredibly exciting and dramatic strategic debate about diplomacy, about technology, about military issues, but I think at its core is a recognition. I think our position is more challenged than people realize. And although um, the dominant, the dominant, you know, idea is that we were talking about China's arrival on the international scene. For most of Asia and the world, they don't think in those terms. China has arrived long ago, and they are a dominant force in Asia. The biggest quiet question that people are careful to talk about is whether we are in the midst of a hurtling decline. And so part of what we have to do is to reassure and engage across the board that in fact we are committed to play a strong, robust role in Asia and the world going forward. But that is not at this moment a settled question. Right. Sorry, that's a long answer to a very good question. No, I'll try great. to be shorter here. That's great, and it, it is a perfect segue to where I'm going next. Your paper on for this book was called How Asia Navigates the U.S.-China Rivalry. Yeah. The stereotype is, and I see this when I travel to Asia, you will hear the ASEAN countries saying, well, we'd like to keep you as a security partner, but China is our most important economic partner. China, yeah, I don't have to tell you this, is the number one trading partner of far more countries around the world than the US is. There's just no way you're gonna get a Cold War where you neatly divide the world into two. What is your solution to that problem? How should we be navigating it? So for, I think the first part, Anya, is an accurate diagnosis. And so I think too often you'll ask people about this and their residue of thinking really is the Cold War where there was a neat line that ran geographically through Europe and you could define and decide who is on which side, who's with us, who is against us. And even though we would say to ourselves in Asia that we understand that the situation is more complex, I think in fact that still permeates a lot of our strategic thinking. And in reality, those lines don't run across borders, they run through countries. And so you will find ministries and groups of people that are much more inclined in thinking about Asia and China and those on, uh, largely on the security and political side who recognize that for the country to survive, they need a strong relationship with the United States and other countries. What I tried to write in my paper is what's happening in Asia right now is one of the most interesting periods of strategic reorientation. And so the middle powers in Asia, Australia, uh, India, Japan, are implementing an incredibly diverse multifaceted strategy, which is not as well understood by us. So they are not saying, we're with you or with the other side. They are doing several things simultaneously. One, they do want a better relationship with the United States and they're trying to increase those contacts. But in But would you say mostly on the military side? Across the board, but every country is wary of the United States right now and understands that there are enormous risks of, you know, you might be cited for trade violations, you might find yourselves in the crosshair. So every country is is trying to develop relations with the United States, probably secretly hopeful that we will go back to something that is more recognizable, um, but also um, believing that our fun that fundamentally our political system has changed and this is not just a Trump phenom phenomena. Second, they're trying to work with like-minded states. So you're seeing of the kind that Nick described, linkages between Australia and India and Japan and others, they're working together kind but of- Frankly, we couldn't have imagined when yeah. we were working in government and now they're Exactly, and, and, and they're doing that on their own. 
every country is trying to increase their own independent capabilities, and that is apparent. Defense spending is much higher in Asia now than it is any other place in the world. That was never the case five or 10 years ago, and we're seeing dramatic increases in defense budgets. So countries want more ability to shape their own futures. Um, uh, they're also uh, thinking very carefully about um, international organizations where they can, but at the core of the strategy is doing what you can to build a stronger relationship with China. And so every one of these countries, the biggest event that's Not about- Not alienating China. Absolutely, the biggest event that's taking place right now in Asia is the preparations in Japan for the visit of Xi Jinping. And so the Japanese are very good at reassuring us, which we appreciate that of course we're number one, but they're also thinking very uh, clearly about a multifaceted diplomatic strategy. So number one, we have to accept that, understand that. You can't overreact and say, no, no, we want more of number one and less of number five, right? You've got to understand that you're playing a longer game. One of the things that I think Nick highlighted in the conclusion, and you will see it in this, it, in so many uh, respects, this is a domestic game. Like, like the judgments in Asia about the United States will have a huge impact on how this plays out. And the interesting thing, if you look at Asia and the United States, is their consistent belief over decades that we are in decline. Right. after Vietnam, after the Cold War, after the global economic crisis. And each time we have managed to recreate ourselves and charge forward. In many cases, surprising our closest friends and allies like Lee Kuan Yew, who was a deep believer for a period of time in American decline. And so we're going to have to do that again to, to make clear that we have staying power and that we're innovative and that we're dynamic and that we welcome competition and engagement and even the dirty word trade in Asia um, that will keep us in the playing uh, sphere for the next 50 years. I think you're right. I make this point when I give speeches in China, I'm sure you do too, is we've been through worse and don't count us out yet, yeah. but there is this sense that we're declining. Let me follow up because we have very little time with where David Shambaugh left off because it fits right into your chapter. <laughs> You wrote that the US strategy in Asia is often more public and confrontational, sort of rally to us. And China's, you say, is more sophisticated. Influence operations, for, I'll give you one concrete example that I'm seeing, fast tracking Chinese goods through customs and having one really fast cohesive, all sorts of small things. David Shambaugh asked, should we be doing more on information operations? How can our strategy be more sophisticated, like you say the Chinese is? Yeah, so I, first of all, I want to commend David on David in the last couple of years has been courageous in, in ways that it is not easy in the public debate. His paper here is, is, is really good. Um, uh, when I say that the, the Chinese, uh, their strategy is more sophisticated, I think, um, and, and we have to be careful, I think Condi is right that we have a tendency to 10 foot tall our competitors. We did that with Japan. We did that with the former Soviet Union and now we're doing that with China. So I, I would be the first to say they have uh, huge limitations to their overall approach. Uh, and, and you see it just in the response to the uh, tragedy of the virus that's playing out now. A tendency to secrecy and lots of anxiety associated with losing face. But at the same time- Though they, on the virus, wouldn't you argue that they're handling it much better than the SARS crisis? I, it's too early to tell on you, know, to be honest. There, are, there is a, there, you know, I'm trying to follow the debate inside China. There is a, a profound group of people that believe that really the horse has left and they are at least a month behind. But you know, I, we're not gonna know this for another couple of weeks. Um, but but every day appears that in fact you know more is coming out and questions about whether uh, local and provincial leaders uh, took steps to rightly alert health officials. But to your larger questions, one of the things that you know you have to read when you look at something like the Belt and Road, we have a tendency in the United States to focus on its weaknesses, and there are clear weaknesses. 
But at the same time, you just can't underestimate how important these infrastructure projects are and what what um, China and Xi Jinping are bringing uh, to countries surrounding China. I had the good fortune to be um, when, when Xi Jinping was the vice president, Anya, he came to the United States. I was his escort officer, along with several of us. We spent quite a lot of time with him around the United States and got to see him in action. He was not very interested in economics, um, not actually terribly curious, uh, completely unsentimental, but super interested in uh, infrastructure, uh, what infrastructure worked, what didn't. We had to take him around some airports that were not our finest. And I remember him looking at me in one of these airports and saying- Did he ask saying, for the not the finest yeah, airport No, we, just, we, we took him to Iowa. We took him to Iowa. I mean, I love Iowa. I don't want to be. We took him to an airport in Iowa because he wanted to reconnect with the, the family that he stayed with when he was a student. And we had problems or we had problems at the gate and, you know, just the typical thing that we all face at certain airports in the United States. But he was very focused on infrastructure and many countries around Asia are incredibly grateful. Yes, of course, they worry about indebtedness, but fundamentally they are welcoming of this. And I, I remember I told this story to Aspen this summer when I was an assistant secretary. We we do some very good work in Asia, but I was on an island that, you know, in the Pacific and and the ambassador picked me up and we were really excited. We got in the in her car and we're driving on this nice road and she said, How do you like the road? And this is a product of the millennial challenge. And I said, this is great, you know, nice two leg road. And we're incredibly excited. We're driving into town. We get about a mile from town and then we're suddenly in this just horrible ruts and terrible, you know, and then she said, we, we didn't have enough funds the to finish it, you know, so, so it, we're going to get a second <laughs> Millennium Challenge grant and hopefully finish the road in a couple of years. I, I just, you know, that matters <laughs> to Asian countries. And so I think we have a tendency to look when a country says we're, they're uncomfortable with something like Malaysia or Pakistan and say, aha, it's not working. They're not interested. Belt and Road is failing. I think that's completely wrong. It's and completely reshaping Asia and South Asia. And as the Singaporeans, many other Southeast Asians would say, look, if the roads are smoother, the rails run faster, it's actually good for all of us and for the yeah, world economy. I agree so with that. Very much have a part I, in, in many respects, I, like when you think, when you ask the question what our strategy should be, if, if most of these countries have a solid, stable relationship with the United States. It gives them more confidence and greater ability to navigate their own future and their status with China. So that's what they're looking for, and that is a good outcome for us as well. So your bottom line would be, don't make people choose. No, I, so I, I, I would, so I hate to say this, but it, that is a really Western, European, the, the key, honestly, Anya, is never ask the question. Mm -hmm. Never never be in a situation <laughs> where, anyone, where anyone would suspect that you wouldn't be completely behind them, assume that those countries are going to work with you, and configure your relations in such a way that you are the dominant player in many of their decision making. And understand clearly what your limitations are and where you're not going to be able to play as effectively. And it's incredibly hard. And it is also the case that China, as, as a player in Asia, I mean, I, the one thing I just ask all of us, it is not an arriving power. It is a dominant power in Asia that most countries quietly will say is the dominant player in Asia. Absolutely. I want to be respectful of people's time because we're nearing the end, but I want to take one, maybe two very short questions from the audience. There is one burning question right there. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell. I, I write the Mitchell Report, and I want to ask a question that really relates all the way through this session. And that is that if, if we were to identify the greatest single strategic uh, <clears throat> strength that we hold in our relationship, for example, with China or with Russia and with other countries, it would seem to me it would be the fact that we have developed alliances and strong alliances and, and that historically China has not. My question uh, to, um, to Mr. Campbell is uh, 
A, does that still hold true today? And B, uh, in a, if there is a way in which you could do it, how do you rate the sort of tensile strength of our alliances in the year 2020 vis-a-vis -vis a decade ago? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I would say that our uh, ultimate strength is uh, not just in our alliances. So I, I don't want to quibble with your point, but in fact, we have created what I would describe as an operating system in Asia. It is our alliances, which are strong. It is our commitment to values, democracy, and human rights. It is a very strong defense commitment that is generally stable and understood. One of the things that Secretary Cohen works so persistently and consistently on, both in Congress and as Secretary of Defense. I was honored to be able to serve and work with him. Um, it is also a strong support in concepts which seem arcane, like, like peaceful resolution of disputes and freedom of navigation, some of the stuff that Condi was saying that middle America poo-poos. This operating system, this whatever you call it, the liberal world order, that commitment that we have built in, in Asia is our single, it is our pyramids. It is our single greatest contribution. It has created the greatest experience of accumulation of wealth and the maintenance of peace and stability of any other period in history. And the challenge is, if I can say, it, that, that system is being challenged by two countries right now. First, more subtly, by China, who like, likes element, like all rising states, likes elements of the system, but wants to redo it in its own image. And that, that, that challenge we can meet and we can affect, I believe. But it is the second challenge that's much more pernicious, and that comes from the United States. So the greatest questions about our operating system come from our political establishment, who believe that Asians are jipping us, that our security alliances are unbalanced, that trade does not work, uh, and that fundamentally we should be more unilateral and withdraw from some of those institutions. And so at the core, the biggest challenge really comes from the United States. And I will also say, many will say, well, this is a Trump phenomenon. I, I'm a Democrat. I can see elements in my own party who are raising questions about why are we doing a lot of this in the world. And so in many respects, not to, you know, those of us that are liberal internationalists, it's a little bit like being a Ronin. You know, you're kind of a masterless <laughs> samurai you're, to, to jump countries. You're not really sure who's going to support your belief, the kinds of things that Nick and several of us around the, uh, the, the room have devoted our lives to, right? So that's a long answer to a question, but I think that's the way I would think about it. Let's hope we're just the Ronin and not an endangered species. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kurt. I'll leave it there on that note of bipartisanship. And we can all go walk back to watching the impeachment proceedings. <laughs> but thank you all very much for being here. Thank you first to Kurt. Let me close with a couple of small remarks, and that is we obviously could only feature a very small number of the fantastic papers that are in the book. They're on the website. They're on the book. Please read them. People put a lot of effort into them, and there's really a lot of nuance and new things in there. And finally, last but not least, none of this would happen without our fantastic Aspen team. So can we please give a big hand of applause to Jonathan and Leah and John and Deb and all the interns who make this all work. Thank you.